<laughs> okay, and I'm actually going to record this separately. Okay, so last time, if you remember, uh, we pointed out two conundrums. Okay, there was the conundrum of uh, if God is unknowable, and like the Rebbeim Bakit and Bakuda we read said that like there's no, you know, the goal is to realize that you have absolutely no comprehension of him whatsoever, and you relate to him through reasoning alone. So on the one hand, that's the truth. On the other hand, all of Tehillim is aimed at like affecting your emotions uh, and getting your emotions in line with your ideas of God. So how can you bridge that gap? You know, like how can you relate to a being that is absolutely unrelatable and unknowable and there's no likeness, no comparison, you know? Uh, and like, what does that endpoint look like? Right. So, I, 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 so that was one, yeah, was it? No, okay, that was one conundrum. Then the other conundrum, was uh was what the I, I call it the Rav's conundrum, which he expressed. Oh, I forgot to bring halachic man. I was gonna bring halachic man to like look at that uh that thing. Is that um that on the one hand, I forgot how I expressed it. Even I think it had something to do with the fact that like everything we say about God is um is detracting from Him. But like and 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 the more we engage in like these um, descriptive things about God, like God loves us, you know, like when I said that Chaim Zifkin's like eyes, you know, like God big, you know, it's inaccurate to say God loves us, yet David does it, and like the Torah does it, and all this stuff, so how do we reconcile that, and that's why the Rav said that the, he says, Klai Yisrael never accepted the Psach of the Rambam, that like we're anti-Putin, you know, um, and that somehow like it is, it is appropriate to like say all these things, you know, so I don't want to answer those two questions, but I want to share a perspective that I had, this is kind of like an epiphany this morning um, that I actually wrote up, I was writing a journal entry on it and then I decided to like type it out. So I actually haven't reread it since this morning. I just like dashed it out in uh, uh, like, a, you know, it was like 10 or 15 minutes. So I, I'm probably gonna make it into an article later on. So there's a, uh, a book, it's actually not a book. It was, a, it's called Letters to a Young Poet. Uh, I, it, I'm only reading it because it was recommended uh, by this guy named Rainer, Maria Rilke, who was some German poet, and he was advising a younger poet on like how to be a poet. Okay, so I read this passage and I was like, this perfectly speaks to um, to how to approach conundrums of this nature. Okay, so I'm gonna read it. And again, this is, this is like my take on this. Okay, uh, so it's, it's a one page thing, but I, I wanna read it because I, I wanna discuss it with you. So this is me talking. <laughs> I started rereading Letters to a Young Poet, 1934, this morning, and came across the following passage uh, with this, with his emphasis. Okay, so this is what he says. You are so young, so before all beginning, and I want to beg you as much as I can, dear sir, to be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like the books... <laughs> Let's start that again. You are so young, so before all beginning, and I want to beg you as much as I can, dear sir, to be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Perhaps you do not carry within yourself the possibility of shaping and forming as a particular happy and pure way of living. Train yourself to it, but take whatever comes with great trust. And if only it comes out of your own will, out of some need of your innermost being, take it upon yourself and hate nothing. Uh, I, I think in, in retrospect, if I were editing this, I would take out that last part because I don't think it's as relevant as I initially thought. Okay, now there's me talking again. Although Rilke was advising a young poet about the art of poetry, I think his words apply equally or perhaps more so to the art of living as a Jew. In my experience as a learner and teacher of Torah, I'm going to read through all the ones and we talk about it. In my experience as a learner and teacher of Torah, I'm convinced that there are students who need answers. They come to school with minds burning with questions that haven't been answered by their parents, rabbis, and other teachers. With such students, there is a real danger that the fire of their curiosity and passionate truth seeking will flicker out if it is not given any fuel. My goal in feeding these flames is never to provide answers as an endpoint in their learning. To the contrary, I know that feeding the flames will increase their drive for learning. When I began teaching, I aimed to provide answers for every question asked by every student. However, as I have matured in learning and in teaching, I've come to realize the truth of Rilke's words. There is a stage of before all beginning in which a Torah student's development will occur not through receiving answers, 
but through loving the questions and living the questions. Indeed, my Gemara Rebbe, talking about Repesach, uh, my Gemara Rebbe's most famous saying among his high school students is appreciate the question, something which is easier to do in Gemara than in ethics, metaphysics, and areas that touch upon the philosophy of living. In my own personal development, I have definitely shifted further along the spectrum from answer seeking towards question living, not because I don't seek answers, but because I know from experience that the answers will only come by living and struggling with the questions. One of these questions I'm struggling with is how do I go about balancing this developmental polarity with my students? Uh, Rilke offers his young poet a related piece of advice. Rilke offers his young poet a related piece of advice. Being an artist means not reckoning and counting, but ripening like the tree which does not force its sap and stands confident in the storms of spring without the fear that after them there may come no summer. It does come, but it comes only to the patient who are there as though eternity lay before them, so unconcernedly still and wide. I learn it daily, learn it with pain to which I am grateful. Patience is everything. This is the type of patience I need at this stage in my development as an educator, uh, while I'm still navigating the transition from high school teacher to a Rebbe in yeshiva. Summer will come. Yeah. Yes. What does he mean by living in the first paragraph? So I can't tell you what he means. <laughs> I can tell you what I mean. <laughs> um, what I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what he means because I just started rereading this book and I don't really know his, uh, his MO. I mean, we could interpret it based on what it says here, but um, just to apply it to, uh, just that, let's think about it through the lens of the issue at hand, right? Like we have this idea of God is unknowable and has no emotions and doesn't relate to us in in, in that way. And all of the the uh, the descriptions of him are Derek Mushel. And yet, like, you know, and so, so part of us says like, you know, distance ourselves from that anthropomorphism. And like, like if we have an emotion that, or uh, that feels like God is like, relating to us in a human way, then that's like wrong. Right. And yet David is condoning it, you know? So it's like, uh, you know, so that's the, what I'm referring to as like the, the um, or the, the, that's the conundrum, right? So, so what it means to live the questions, according to my understanding is like continue basically like thinking in line with both of those premises, you know, and learning in line with both those premises. And, and the, the, the patient's point at the end is basically like, there is this feeling that I, there's an urgency, like I need to find the answer right now, or like I need to get the answer, or I need, you know, I, I, like I, I, one needs to be true or primary, you know, and that's like why I love this analogy here of the um, the ripening uh, of, of a tree can't be forced; it's just a natural process, and that forcing it is not going to help. And like the, you know. It, not only is it not going to help, but by trying to force the answer, you're going to like stunt or artificially divert the process of the organic development of the idea. So, you know, so we learn Yisodei HaTorah, Hilkos Yisodei HaTorah, and say the Shema in the morning. I mean, we don't learn Yisodei HaTorah. We say the Shema in the morning where we think about the fact that God is absolutely unknowable and one. And then we also daven and say Avinu Malkeinu, you know, and, and that's a, a paradoxical thing. You know, or we know that the Raman was against Putin, and then like we say these Putin, you know, and and like the important thing is uh, like, that I, I'm saying here is like to not try to dismiss or push away the question or to push yourself to one side or the other, but to continue like in the tension, like living in the tension between those the, the, these difficult ideas, and that will get you to the point where you will find whatever answers you, you find. And I'd say that the person who wants to seek the answer is looking for psychological security. You know, like that's, that, the, the, really they're not, they think they're looking for answers, but really they're looking for psychological security because they want it now, you know? And if I told this person, well, the answer is not going to come now, they're going to feel frustrated. And if I said the answer is only going to be, like, like, like the Raman says, you, know, you wake up any person in the middle of the night and you say, uh, you know, do you want to learn like, the, uh, the greatest secrets of all of existence. Uh, wait, let me see if I can get the quote up here. Uh, it's, it's good to hear the Ramam say it. Um, oh, what do I call it? Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, what if I have in the word premature truth? No. Oh man, if I can't find it like in a minute, then no. Um, hold on. Uh, ah, prerequisite? Requisite. No. 
basically, Ramam says, like, you know, you ask anyone, uh, oh, here we go, becoming uh, lessons on becoming acquainted with truth. Yeah, that's it. So he says, um, yeah, now if you awaken a man, oh, he says, man has in his nature a desire to seek the ends. This is in the morning book in 134. And he often finds preliminaries tedious and refuses to engage in them. Know, however, that if an end could be achieved without the preliminaries that preceded, the latter would not be preliminaries, but pure distractions and futilities. Now, if you awaken a man, even though he were the dullest of all people, as one awakens a sleeping individual, and if you were to ask him whether he desired at that moment to have knowledge of the heavenly spheres, namely what is their number and what their configuration and what is contained in them, and what angels are and how the world as a whole was created, and what its end is in view of the arrangement of its various parts with one another, and what the soul is, and how it is created in time in the body, and whether the human soul can be separated from the body, and if it can, in what matter, and through what instrument, and with what distinction in view, and if you put the same question to him in regard to the other subjects of research in this kind, he would undoubtedly answer you in the affirmative. He would have a natural desire to know these things as they are in truth, but he would wish this desire to be allayed and the knowledge of all this to be achieved by means of one or two words that you should say to him, right, soundbite. If, however, you lay upon, would lay upon him the obligation to abandon his occupation for a week's time until he should understand all this, he would not do it, but would be satisfied with deceptive imaginings through which the soul, his soul would be set at ease. He would also dislike being told uh, that there is a thing whose knowledge requires many premises and a, and a long time for investigation. So I, that's what I mean. Like it's it's the the person thinks he wants the answers, but if you tell him what is an answer, an answer is the 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 perception that the mind has of the idea after it goes through all of these preliminaries. He doesn't want that. He just wants like his his curiosity to be quenched, you know. Uh, and he doesn't want to be in the state of tension. Mm -hmm. So, so like the when I, I want to bring this up, uh, especially because when we talk about the conundrums, I, I I don't I didn't realize it at the time, but I use the word conundrum because it is a uh, an outstanding, lasting problem that needs to be grappled with. You know, not a difficult kushya. You know, that that can be answered like if you just get the right answer. You know, yeah, yeah. Hi, uh uh, yeah, David, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, just then also insofar as particular to what we, when you have a conundrum and then a consequence that follows the conundrum, right? Like particular to what we were talking about on Tuesday night. Yeah. Where like there's this unsolvable, okay, so there's like what you're saying now, but I like, appreciate the question living in that. But then anything that comes after that consequentially, we also just have to, I mean, do the best we can in understanding it, but still just appreciate questions in the areas within that in itself, because it's following the conundrum and to be satisfied yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, conundrums yield other problems and other questions and other difficulties. Yeah, yeah. and you have to use the same approach with that, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the real difficulty is that there are difficulties that can be answered, right? So like, it would be very easy if I told you that this is a conundrum and anything that emerges from this conundrum, you also have to sit with, but that's not the case. There are things that emerge from the conundrum that you do have to sit with like you were describing and like you're not gonna be able to answer. And then there are things that there are answers to so you never know like whether you're going to, to you know, what, you know, whether you're, I mean, if I knew more about botany, I could probably give an example of like some flower that you just don't know when it's gonna bloom and then suddenly it'll bloom. You know, you never know when like the thing will, uh, will suddenly like, like click. So you can't allow yourself to fall into a place of complacency where you're just like, okay, like, yeah, that's a classic question. Like, let, you know, like I'm not gonna, you, know, you need to be constantly on the edge of, not at all times, but like, like you, you have to be on the, the pushing at the horizons of your understanding at all times. Otherwise you will miss it. Otherwise the development could be happening. And if you let the question become stale, again, it doesn't mean you have to be constantly involved in the question because there is a phenomenon of work on the question intensively, leave it and then come back to it like a couple of months later when you're a different person and your mind is fresh. You know, I don't mean constantly work at it, but what I mean is you can't let it become, we put stuff on the back burner, you can't let the back burner go off you know, like entirely and let the thing just become cold. Um, and that's when you see, if you've ever seen like jaded Jews, you know, whether like it is a, like ball bottom or jaded educators who would just say, oh yeah, it's a classic, you know, Mahlo's Ramam Ramban. And then they said like, really? Like that's where you're holding? Like, you know, Rambam didn't contend himself there. Ramban didn't contend himself there. They kept pushing, you know, and it's okay to say, like, I don't know who is right at this point, the Ramban or the Rambam, but I'm not going to just like, like, uh, resign myself to apathy. You know, that's like, that, that, that's equally dangerous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the paradox in this situation? 
The paradox in this situation is that God is unrelatable and the highest level we can get to is Avas Hashem, Nir Hashem, which is relating to him as something that we know. I mean, that's part of it. And all of the way that David Melech talks about God is in rich, emotional, vivid, visceral terms, which would seem to go against the God that Rabbeinu Bachia depicts of like, shed all likenesses of him and find him through reasoning alone. Shed all likenesses. Yeah, I'll reread the Rabbeinu Bachia just because, uh, um, uh, oh, how did I find that? <laughs> Hang on, that's how I found it. Uh, Pakuda. Rabbeinu Bachia and Pakuda says, in 110, the ultimate result of your knowledge of God should be the confection and conviction that of his glorious essence, you are completely ignorant. If you form in your mind or imagination a picture or representation of the creator, strive to investigate his being, and then you will be convinced of his existence and all likenesses of him will be rejected by you so that you will find him through reasoning alone. It seems very at odds with Tehillim and Tefillah. What does he mean by likenesses? Uh, saying that God is like this or like that. Right, so that's like a, a false conception of God. Right, but yet we say, mm-hmm. we're likening him to a melech. Mm-hmm. And the irony, according to the modern, is you're likening him to a melech by saying, like, just like a melech is unknown, you know, well, already that's a strike against you, you know? He's like the king above all other kings. Right, yeah. Or and, and this is why the Ramam says, you, you know, the Ramam says, Lachad Dumya Sahila, to you silence is praise. You know, that would really be the best way to praise God is to not say anything. But then because that would leave us with nothing and we wouldn't have any means of getting knowledge of God, then we can't leave ourselves there. So we have to like straddle this like fence of describing God in terms that are imperfections, you know, that are are false as the only way to get to whatever way we can relate to the truth of the matter is. While we're on this document, by the way, there's a good Freud quote also um, in the introductory lectures. Uh, he says, um, yeah, uh, oh, there's actually two Freud quotes. Uh, it would be a mistake to suppose that a science consists entirely of strictly proved theses, uh, and it would be unjust to require this. Only a disposition with a passion for authority will raise such a demand, someone with a craving to replace his religious catechism by another, though it is a scientific one. Science has only a few apodictic propositions in its catechism. I think apodictic means something like like absolute or self-evident. Um, the rest are assertions promoted by it to some particular degree of probability. It is actually a sign of a scientific mode of thought to find satisfaction in these approximations to certainty and to be able to pursue constructive work further in spite of the absence of final confirmation. Now that's more tame than what I was saying. I'm saying it is a, uh, I would say, I would modify by saying it is a scientific mode of thought to be able to, to proceed with seemingly like, like irreconcilable contradictions knowing that the only way forward is to keep on being involved in the knowledge, you know, uh, but there's another Freud quote that I, that is relevant here. Oh yeah. Um, uh, oh, and actually no, the other one's not related. Never mind. Yeah. I was mixing it with someone else. Yeah. How do you differentiate between a conundrum where it's a seeming contradiction and an actual contradiction? Yeah. That's the other problem. You wouldn't tell right. Question, but you can share the right. Just, you know, go along. <laughs> there's another conundrum for you. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think we have a leg up with uh, with the, um, you know, let's say I'm just gonna use the Rambam because he says it the clearest, but like someone like the Rambam, who you know is very clear about God having no likenesses, and yet the Rambam davened and said to Hillen, you know, and Rum wrote the book on contradictions, you know, so like, like, you know, when you, you, uh, you know, so you could say, oh, yeah, the Rambam just like was, uh, you know, miss this one, but but that's that would be like a really intellectually dishonest position to take. The real question is so so in our case, I'm saying like it's easy to tell that it's like a, a conundrum. The, the the real question is like, what if you find something that no one is none of the the Gdole Hamasora are identifying as a conundrum? You know, how do you know? I don't know. That's <laughs> that's a real conundrum. Yeah, yeah. I guess the the problem I have with this specific conundrum is like since it's an unknowable thing at the end of the day like you never really get to the end of this this conundrum like like when would you have be, ever be able to look back and say like oh now i think i've like gotten an understanding in this area like right i can't know about this it just is an unknowable thing right so um i'm actually uh uh gonna talk about this a little bit 
uh, in the, the Stoju podcast that's going up tomorrow. Uh, but I'm going to read to you what I what I um, what I said there. There's an excerpt from the Ramban and Shara Gamul. Um, so he's I'll set the context here. So he's talking about so the Shara Gamul is about reward and punishment, right? And uh, he deals with a lot of different questions. And um, and one of the questions is Sadi Viralo, right? Why do we, and, and Rosh Vatovlo, right? So uh, so the first question he asks is, or one of the questions he deals with is like, is there actually such a case as Sadi Viralo or Rosh Vatovlo? And he ends up saying no. And his ultimate conclusion is everything God does is just, right? So then he raises this question and he says, and then, by the way, that's another conundrum. When we were doing the Rambam uh, in the Gutman uh, essay, which we're putting on high, uh, 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 on hold for a while, um, he the Rambam himself said that when it comes to Hashgacha, then uh, let me just get the the exact lashon. Um, the Rambam said, "Say it wrong, yeah." Oh, it's so slow. Um, he said in his intro. That here, my opinion to you on the, this principle of divine providence, I will now explain to you. Uh, in the principle which I now proceed to expound, I do not rely on the conclusion to which demonstration has led me, but on what has been clearly appeared as the intention of the book of God and the writings of our prophets. The principle which I accept contains fewer incongruities and is nearer to intellectual reasoning than the opinions mentioned before. So, so Godman explained that um, he says that uh, we learn from these statements that the issue of divine providence contains inherent conflicts between the literal text of Tanakh possible interpretations of that text and rational thought. We also learn that providence is not an empirically provable concept. That's what the Ram meant when he said he's not getting from demonstration, but rather an ontological view of our daily life based on revelation. Without revelation, the writings of the prophets, we would come to different conclusions about providence. The challenge is to accommodate our independent conclusions with those of the prophets teach us. Ram Ram proposes to do that and believes his approach is the best. We, however, get the message that the most we can expect is that it will contain fewer incongruities and is nearer to intellectual reasoning, but ultimately the two will never be 100% in accord. Um, so this is the this is a conundrum also, the conundrum of reconciling your knowledge of Hashgacha with experience of reality. And I'll tell you, the greatest Nevi'im actually felt this as a conundrum. This is the entire book of Eicha, right? Yimiyahu Navi, who the Chazal say was like second to Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, in, in some Midrashim, like who was the one who delivered the prophecy of the Hurban, who knew it was just at the same time, you know, that he's saying you deserve this also said, how could God do this? And, and, and Havakuk is the other example who like writes uh, at length about like, you know, the Tzadik Varala and saying like, this is, this is, uh, this does not square with my understanding of God's, uh, you know, of God's justice. And yet, you have uh, Avram Avinu who like argue, argued with God until like it, you know, until it was resolved. So I'm saying this is another conundrum that the Ramban saying. Okay, now to go back to the Ramban. So the Ramban raises this point here. He says, um, okay, he says like this. Um, and if you will object saying, since certain aspects, this is the Shara Hagamul in 341. If you will object saying, since certain aspects of God's justice are hidden from us, and since we are required to believe in his righteousness as the true judge, why do you trouble us and exhort us to learn the rational arguments that you have explained and the abstract ideas to which you have alluded, right? Why can't we throw all this behind us and rely as we ultimately must on the belief that there is no iniquity or forgetfulness before him, but that all his ways are just, right? Why don't, why do we, in other words, if you start off the investigation by saying, okay, God is just and Saudi for all in Russia tell law, and you end up by saying, okay, God is just, Despite Tadik Rallo and Russia tell low, why do we need to go through all this like Shah Gamul and Eov, right? Why can't we just like forget all that and say, okay, fine, I accept that God is just. Right? Is he... I mean, it doesn't need reasons to accept that God is just. Okay, so that's that's that that is essentially his answer. So he says like this: he gives a, a double whammy answer. Whammy one. Well, first he says, uh, this is an objection of fools who despise wisdom. Xilim Moase Achachma. The answer is that we benefit ourselves through the aforementioned learning and become chachamim who know God, may he be blessed, by way of God's conduct and actions. And in my understanding of it is he's saying, why? Like, why, why is this good? Because it's the purpose of man to know God's actions, uh, you know, to know God through his actions. So it's no big deal. It's just like 
you're fulfilling the purpose of man by doing this. Okay. But then secondly, furthermore, we will have even more emuna and bitachon, conviction and security, than those who do not pursue rational inquiry in both the known and the hidden aspects of God's justice. It is the obligation of every created being who serves God out of love and awe to investigate with his mind and to confirm the righteousness of his justice and to verify his judgment according to one's ability. The approach we have taken is the approach of Chachamim, to bring our minds in line with the ideas and to rationally ver verify or actually vindicate uh, or justify the creator's judgments. So he's saying that, that you will, it's true that you end up with the same statement that God is just and I can't understand the Tzadik Ra, uh, you know, Tzadik Varalo case. I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know what his sheet is, but you might get to that point. But you have a conviction in God's justice based on all the knowledge that you gained, and you can take security. <laughs> Ironically, the security that the guy who wants the immediate answers is trying to get, the only way to actually get that is through the knowledge itself, because then you're not accepting it based on authority or based on desperation. You're accepting it because it's what all the knowledge points to. You know, so whatever security you get, you can hope to get, you can get through this, uh, through this knowledge. So what question was asked that led me here? Um, the difficulty of this conundrum. Yeah. And one which has one side is like, never know it. Oh, right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So similarly here, you ultimately cannot, you know, low maxwell sign, uh, low maxwell Ultimately, man can't even fully know God's actions and his makshavos, yet you can get closer and closer and closer. And, and like the Ramam says, you know, uh, have fewer incongruities uh, and, and be nearer to intellectual reasoning. And that will get you for like that is actually getting you further, you know. Um, uh, now, again, it's it's an asymptote, like in terms of you will never know God's essence, but you're getting closer through negative knowledge and through knowing his actions. Which I guess is the subject of the first seven psukim in Ashrei going to the Malbim, right? Uh, if the, that that thing of like trying to know God and yet him, him being hidden, yeah. But you, the question you raised, Yaakov, is a good one. Like, how do you know if this is an actual contradiction or a uh, a conundrum? I don't know. Well, and, and and that's why, by the way, like you know, just to, not to bring up a, a, a controversial thing, but like you know, I mentioned in my raw box here, you know, that's where you get people like the raw bog who will say, "Look, I know that all the other chachamim around me say that God created the universe Yeshme Ayin, but the raw bog said I can't accept that because I hold it's impossible," and he was forced to to rely on his mind and to like reinterpret the Torah and reinterpret Chazal like, you know, to, to make sense of it, you know, and it's, and it, it, that sounds like apologetics, but it is literally no different than a scientist who is confronted with something that he sees in empirical data that looks like it should be impossible. And you have to submit yourself to the facts, like, and then come up with a new theory based on the facts, like, you know, like, like, that's not, that's not uh, dishonest. That is science, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course you could do it in a dishonest way also. And that would be dishonest. You know, you could do apologetics. You could do like, 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 you know, warping things in order to, you know, the story with the, uh, the you know, I've told this story a bunch of times with the Grizz and the, um, and Ramosha Solvajic with the Matas, you know, is a, a ring a bell. That's the, um, uh, I heard this from Rabbi Fox. So I hope I get it right. Is that, uh, that there's this, that halacha that if you have uh, Lecha Mishnah, you know, they have to be two intact loaves. And uh, let's say like one of them is cracked or broken, so you can like mush it together to make it appear whole, okay? Um, and uh, and that's really what you're supposed to do to get lecha mishnah. So that's like the pesach halacha. So what do you do on pesach uh, if the matzah is broken? So if you can fit the jigsaw pieces together, so then it is uh, then you when you make a moti, you hold them together so that it looks whole. So the story goes that Reb Chaim sent his uh, you know the uh, sent Reb Moshe and the Grizz to go pick up the matzahs. And I don't know if it was like a you know bumpy uh, carriage road or whatever that they got home and all the matzahs were broken. So they said, okay, well, what, what do we have to do before pays out? We have to like figure out all the uh, we have to make all these uh, you know shlemim, you know, uh, make all the whole whole ones. So so you take this half uh, and I'll take this half. So they work and work and work. And like I don't know who which one's which, but like Ramosha looks over and sees the Grizz has like all these stacks of like these like these perfect jigsaw matas that he it'll, it, that are all whole you know, that he put together and Ramosha only has like a few. So Ramosha's like, how, like, what method are you using? Like, how do you like, uh, you know, how did you achieve this? So he says, oh, well, when this piece doesn't fit with this one, I break off a little here and break off a little here and then I can fit them together, <laughs> you know? So Ramosha says, people do the same thing with Svaras. 
if 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 they have a svara and the facts don't fit, they just break off a little here and break off a little here. And now they have a good svara, you know. So like that's the problem. Also, is like you could be engaging in that process, thinking that you're doing something intellectually honest, and you're really not. So like it, it, it's you know, it, it's you gotta have a lot of self knowledge. Also, have like a false that you're working. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy for a person to say like to dismiss facts or to like 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 you know pull a move that is really you know a stretch but he convinces himself no 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 it's a good answer you know right. and just like patch it all up yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and again look this is the uh, I, I i've never seen this shot in um in any of the mafarshan but jesse fishman's shot on the name yisrael you know well the psukim say ki sarisa im Elohim imanashim you wrestled with god and with man and you prevailed uh, Jesse uh, applies that to like the nature of religious growth or development in Judaism is a wrestling match, you know, um, and it's not a, a smooth um, sailing road. I mean, you know, see footnote four in a lot of the man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Any other uh, food for thought, obviously, but any other immediate uh, questions or comments on this? Yeah, sorry. So I, I I felt I had to say that because it was on my mind. Yeah. All right, good. So let's let's stop the recording here because I want to um make Tehillim be its own thing here. Okay, stop the recording. I will say.